you have your Bible with you, I invite you to join me in looking up today's text from the Gospel of John, John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. And that's wrong. I'm going to read right up to 1 to 11. John chapter 12. And as we pause to hear God's word preached and proclaimed, let's ask him to illumine us that we might hear his voice and respond to him. Let us pray. God of call, God of transformation, God of the Lenten journey, help us to discern your still small voice. Open us to change and growth that we may walk where you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 12, starting at the first verse. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She wiped it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A man was shopping for a Valentine's Day gift for his wife as he passed the cosmetics counter, and it occurred to him that perfume might be the perfect gift. So he asked the sales representative to show him some of the most popular brands of perfume, The first bottle she brought out was a little one worth $150. That's a bit too much, he said. You have something a little less expensive. So she brought out another brand for $130. That is still quite a bit, he said. Do you have anything cheaper? So the sales representative brought out an armful of bottles, ranging in price from $80 all the way down to $18. She placed them in front of the husband, who picked up the $18 bottle and then set it aside and said, What I mean is, I'd like to see something really cheap. The sales representative handed him a mirror. (laughs) In, In contrast to this, Mary obviously spared no expense in the perfume she brought out to anoint Jesus with. In our text this morning, Jesus is in Bethany, keeping a low profile as the Pharisees are looking for a reason to have him arrested. We could happily think that this dinner could be a joyous affair as everyone has ample reason to be grateful for, to Jesus as they watch the risen Lazarus pass dinner plates around the table. Then Mary interrupts the dinner party by pouring a large amount of extremely expensive perfume all over Jesus' feet. The aroma, reports John, filled the whole house. I can imagine. A family on vacation came back from their trip to an unexpected welcome, Their car, waiting patiently in the airport parking lot, had an odd sheen on the windows when they walked up to it. After surveying the car from several angles and determining that nothing looked particularly amiss, they opened up the door to get in and were pushed back by an intensely aromatic cloud that poured out of the car. And after a few minutes, the father pushed his way into the car and discovered that a brand new canister of deodorant overlooked on the passenger seat had burst as the sealed car baked in the summer sun. So the family opened the doors, rolled down the windows, and began the hour-long drive home. The overpowering aroma forced everyone to ride with their heads almost hanging out the window. When they got home, they discovered that the smell had forced its way into their clothing. They spent weeks scrubbing the car's upholstery in a vain effort to remove the smell. They were forced to resign themselves to smelling like armpits every time they went anywhere, in the family car. 
And I'm sure the smell from the broken bottle of perfume in the house at that dinner given in Jesus' honor was just as strong as the smell in that family's car. I wonder how long the smell lingered on the clothes of the guests of that dinner party. Was the smell of the burial ointment still on Jesus' feet less than a week later as he hung on the cross? This story takes place the day before Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it's rich and symbolic, and it's a beautiful story of Mary, so full of gratitude to Jesus for raising her brother from the grave that she worships him in this extravagant fashion. Mary's action shows her understanding of the majesty and greatness of Jesus Christ. She shows exactly what she thinks Jesus is worth when she pours the expensive nard on his feet. She willingly, cheerfully, and eagerly gives the finest thing she has. This is not a duty, but a delight for her. If she had something of greater value to give, no doubt she would have given it to her Lord. Jesus brought life into Mary's world of death, and she was so grateful. And then, Judas opens his mouth and almost wrecks the holy moment. That money could have been given to the poor. Instead, she's wasted it. Judas sort of makes you think about that annoying brother-in-law with the small heart and the big mouth. Well, not too many of you have a brother-in-law like that. Okay, good to hear. But Jesus says, Stop annoying this woman. She alone, out of all of you, understands. She's the only one who really gets it. You know, what Judas said was technically right. That perfume was worth a lot of money that could have been given to the poor. Judas said all the right words, but his heart was all wrong. We read in the text that he didn't really care about the poor at all. Max Lucado has written, and I agree with him, that it's better to have the wrong creed and the right heart than it is to have the right creed and the wrong heart. And Judas is sure a good example of that right creed, wrong heart here. Ultimately, Jesus, or Judas sold Jesus for 30, 30 pieces of silver for his own gain, whereas Mary broke her bottle of ointment worth so much more than Judas received to betray Jesus simply because she loved Jesus. Judas kept the bag Mary broke the bottle. And by bowing before Jesus and anointing his feet like this, Mary is worshiping him. Mary is showing that she understands what so many have failed to see. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of Israel, the Almighty God in human flesh. Yet Jesus suggests an additional meaning of this anointing. She's anointing me in preparation for my death, he says. Really? Yes. By the end of the week, Jesus would be hanging on the cross. The one whom Mary worships and anoints is going to his death for us. Clearly, this is not the God that anyone there at the dinner expected. Nobody at that time expected a God who would do this. It's not how anybody would have presumed Jesus would establish his reign. A God who would give everything he had, yes, even his very life, to save us. It was the wake of the Great Depression and times were hard. In Kilgore, Texas, countless men were out of work and had no way to support their families. The Krim family owned land outside of town and at the general store where everybody shopped. Out of necessity, because nobody had any money, they began extending credit, which proved to be a mixed blessing. The folks could still buy their groceries, but in so doing, they went deeper and deeper into debt. One day, the Crims got word that oil had been discovered on their property. And just like that, the Crims were wealthy beyond their wildest imagination. Being good Presbyterians, they wondered what they could possibly do to thank God for his great blessing. They'd always been faithful and generous in their support of the church, but this was really big. So the family huddled, and they made a decision. They sent word to all their customers, asking them to come to the store at 8 o'clock Saturday morning for a very important meeting. The customers, not knowing what the meeting was about and knowing full well how much they all owed the Crims, braced for the worst. Were the Crims going to seize their properties? By 8 o'clock Saturday morning, practically the whole town of Kilgore was milling around in front of the general store. Malcolm Crim, the oldest brother, came out and stood on the front porch, and a hush fell over the crowd. In his hand, he held the box containing the cards of all the customers detailing their charges and debt. It didn't look good. He spoke clearly and to the point. 
Oil has been discovered on our land. Prosperity has come to Kilgore. As of that day, all debts were canceled. And you can just imagine the celebration. The town had the celebration of the century. Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead that you and I might have the gift of life in all its abundance, both now and for all eternity. The debt of our sins that we could never pay has been canceled. We have something to celebrate too. Even more than the town of Kilgore did, Jesus has brought life into our world of death. Jesus has brought light into our world of darkness, hope into our world of despair, joy into our world of disappointment, forgiveness into our world of retribution, and love into our world of hate. Jesus did all that, and we are forgiven. We are made right not by our own efforts, but by the one whose death pays the price for our sins. All of our sins, all of our transgressions, all of our failings are completely drowned in the sea of God's extravagant forgiveness. And this is all a gift that comes out of his great and extravagant love for us. A love we even catch a little glimpse of in the way Mary worships her Lord Jesus. A love that never calculates the cost. A love that gives it all, and a love that has only one regret, that it doesn't have more to give. So what is our response when we consider a love for us like that? A love that put the Almighty God on the cross willingly, naked and bleeding and dying for us? The hymn writer put it like this, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Jesus walks the way of the cross for us. And though we can hardly fathom what that means or why he would do it, therein lies all our hope. And though we continue to sin and stumble and fall and fail, he continues to love us and forgive us and save us as he always has. And that's why we worship him, just like Mary did. There's a story that was making the rounds on the internet 10 or 15 years ago, and I told it here sometime about this Sunday in 2013. Tess was a precocious eight-year-old little girl. One day she heard her mom and dad talking in a serious and somber tone about her little brother, Andrew. Tess didn't understand everything that they were saying, but she got the gist. Her little brother, Andrew, was very, very, very sick, and they were completely out of money. They would have to move out of their house and move into a small apartment because mom and dad didn't have enough money for the doctor bills and the house payment. On top of that, only a very expensive surgery could save Andrew now, and they could not find anyone to lend them the money. Just then, Tess heard her dad say to her tearful mother in whispered desperation, I think only a miracle can save Andrew now. So Tess ran to her room, pulled out a glass jelly jar from its hiding place in her closet. She poured out all the change on the floor and counted it carefully. She then put the change back in the jar, put the jar under her arm, slipped out the back door and ran down to the Rexall drugstore a couple blocks away. The pharmacist was busy talking to a man intently and at first he didn't notice little Tess standing there at the counter. She waited patiently for a while, then dramatically cleared her throat, but still no luck. The pharmacist didn't see her. Finally, Tess got his attention by taking a quarter out of her jelly jar and tapping it on the glass counter. That did it. The the pharmacist smiled, noticing her, and said, Just a minute, I'm talking to my brother. He's from Chicago. I haven't seen him for ages. Well, said Tess, I want to talk to you about my brother. He's really, really sick, and I want to buy a miracle. His name is Andrew, and he has something growing inside his head, and my daddy says only a miracle can save him now. So how much does a miracle cost? I have the money here to pay for it. It's all that I have. If it's not enough, I'll get some more. Just tell me how much a miracle costs. The pharmacist's brother was a well-dressed man. He stooped down and asked Test, what kind of miracle does your brother need? I don't know, Tess replied with her eyes welling up. I just know he's really sick and mommy says he needs an operation, but my parents can't pay for it, so I want to use my money. How much do you have? asked the man from Chicago. 
One dollar and eleven cents, Tess said proudly. It's all the money I have in the world, but I can get some more if I need to. Well, you're in luck, the man said with a smile. One dollar and eleven cents is the exact price of a miracle for little brothers. He took the money in one hand, and with the other he took hold of her mitten and said, Take me to where you live. I want to see your brother and meet your parents. Let's see if I have the kind of miracle you need. Well, it turned out the well-dressed man from Chicago was Dr. Carlton Armstrong, who just happened to be a noted neurosurgeon. And the operation was successfully completed without charge. And it wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing well. Tessa's mom and dad were so grateful. They were talking one night about the chain of events that had saved Andrew's life. That surgery, her mom said, was a real miracle. And then she said, I just wonder how much it would have cost. Tess smiled. She knew exactly how much such a miracle costs. One dollar and eleven cents. That little girl gave in an extravagant way all she had, and it saved her little brother's life. And when the Almighty God extravagantly gave everything he had in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of his son, Jesus Christ, it saved the whole world, you and me included. And for that, even pouring the most expensive perfume we could ever find over the feet of Jesus like Mary did wouldn't be enough. Worshiping him here together, worshiping him in how we live out our lives, none of it is even close to being enough. No wonder the hymn writer concluded, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us respond in song.